So, Mr. President, thank you again for having me here. As partners, friends, and allies, I look forward to our work together in the years ahead, and it's been a real pleasure getting to know you even better. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have time for questions. Mm, uh, shall we start with uh, Ule and uh, Ida Tikka? Uh, you. Finnish Public Broadcasting Service. Uh, my question is for Mr. President Biden. Uh, the political volatility of U.S. remains a big worry for European partners. Meanwhile, back in Washington, a bipartisan group of senators has repeatedly failed to pass uh, through Senate a bill that would prevent the U.S. presidents in the future from withdrawing from NATO without Senate's approval. What I'm sorry, without what? I'm sorry? I didn't hear the last part of your question. Uh, in Washington, a bipartisan group of senators has repeatedly failed to pass through Senate a law that would prevent future U.S. presidents from withdrawing from NATO without Senate's approval. What actions will you take to assure Finland that the U.S. will remain a reliable NATO partner for decades to come? I absolutely guarantee it. There is no question. There's overwhelming support from the American people. There's overwhelming support from the members of the Congress, both House and Senate. In both parties, notwithstanding the fact there's some extreme elements of one party, we will stand together. The American people known for the since the end of World War II and the formation of NATO that our security rests in the unanimity among European and transatlantic partner, us. And so this is, you know, no one can guarantee the future, but this is the best bet anyone could make. And my second question on that note to uh, Mr. President Niinistö, uh, hearing this answer that no one can guarantee a future, are you worried that the political instability in the U.S. will cause issues in the alliance in the future? Let me be clear. I didn't say we didn't guarantee it. We couldn't guarantee the future. You can't tell me whether you're going to be able to go home tonight. No one can be sure what they're going to do. I'm saying as sure as anything can possibly be said about American foreign policy, we will stay connected to NATO. Connected to NATO, beginning, middle, and end. We're a transatlantic partnership. That's what I've said. It seems that uh, the President has answered your problems. But um, I have to tell you that uh, during this process, I met uh, approximately the uh, President many times, but uh, uh, I would say about 50 people from Congress and Senate. And uh, I think the message was quite clear, quite united. And uh, I have no reason to doubt about uh, USA policies in the future. Let me say one more thing. We learned a hard lesson. Peace and security in Europe is essential to US security and peace. The idea that there could be conflict in Europe among our friends and us not engaged has never happened in modern history. That's why we're staying together. Next question, President Biden. Oh, I've called on somebody. I'm sorry. Um, Wall Street Journal. Andrew? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you've said that Ukraine shouldn't enter NATO until after the war is over. Are you concerned at all that those comments could motivate Putin to keep the war going or discourage him from, from entering peace negotiations? And is there a serious risk that this war could drag on for years? Um, and do you see any path toward the war ending with Putin still in power? First of all, um, no one can join NATO while the war, a war is going on where a NATO nation is being attacked, because that guarantees that we're in a war, and we're in a third world war. So that is not about whether or not they should or shouldn't join. It's about when they can join, and they will join NATO. The uh, issue of whether or not uh, um, this is going to keep Putin from continuing to fight, the answer is Putin's already lost the war. Putin has a real problem. How does he move from here? What does he do? And so the idea that there's going to be what vehicle is used, he could end the war tomorrow. He could just say, I'm out. But what agreement is ultimately reached depends upon Putin 
and uh, what he decides to do. But there, there is no possibility of him winning the war in Ukraine. He's already lost that war. Imagine if, even if, anyway, he's already lost that war. Um, just on the question of, of a concern about it going on for years, um, is there a possibility that there's a stalemate in this becoming? I'm sorry. The question of whether the war could go on for years, is there a possibility there's a stalemate and it can continue for quite some time? Well, I don't think the war can go on for years for two reasons. Number one, I don't think that the uh, that Russians could, uh, could maintain the war forever, number one, in terms of their resources and capacity. Number two, uh, I think that uh, there is going to be a circumstance where uh, eventually uh, President Putin is going to decide it's not in the interest of Russia, economically, politically, or otherwise, to continue this war. Um, but I can't predict exactly how that happens. My hope is, and my expectation is, you'll see that Ukraine makes significant progress on their offensive and that uh, it uh, generates an, a negotiated settlement uh, somewhere along the line. Um, and I have a question for the Finnish uh, president, but I would be remiss if I didn't raise my colleague Evan Gershkovich, who's been in prison for more than 100 days. And I just wondered if you had an update on, on um, the process for trying to get him out of prison and if you're serious about a prisoner exchange. Oh, I'm serious about prisoner exchange. I'm serious about doing all we can to free Americans from being illegally held in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. And that process is underway. Like I <clears throat> told, we are discussing on GCA, the Defense um, Cooperation Agreement, and uh, it has a lot of elements. They are still open, but uh, we are open on negotiations, and I know that uh, uh, our counterpart is also very open. So, uh, let us see. Next question goes to President Niinistö, please. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, Helsingin Sanomat and Elina Antonen. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is for Mr. President Biden. Okay. Or should I just say President Biden? <laughs> you have repeatedly talked about Finlandization becoming NATOization of Finland. Now, based on so your... As what nation? You have repeatedly talked about Finlandization oh, becoming NATOization of Finland. Based on your long experience, how does that change Finland's place in the world? Well, first of all, the context in which I said that was the gentleman who occupies a seat on the other side of your border in Moscow said he wanted, I said he wanted the Findalization of NATO. I said it was more likely he was going to get the NATOization of Finland. <laughs> that's, what, that's the context in which that was said. And uh, what was the second part of your question? I asked, how has Finland's position in the world changed during this Look, NATO membership process? Finland's already a strong, vibrant nation. I think what Finland's joining NATO does, and with Sweden as well, when the Nordic countries are all members of, <coughs> of, of NATO, just makes the world safer significantly increases the prospect that there is less likely to be war. We're, we're deadly earnest about the notion. We defend every single inch of NATO territory. And now we're, gonna, we're on a way of getting to 32 NATO nations. That's a significant commitment. And so the likelihood of any nation voluntarily deciding they're going to attack <clears throat> one of the nations or Finland is highly unlikely. And so, but if it, if a word to, they understand they're not just attacking Finland, they're attacking 31 other countries. Next question, President Biden, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I guess it's uh, Arlette, CNN. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. 
We've seen more disarray with Russian generals, most recently with the firing of a general who criticized the defense ministry, this following that rebellion by Prigozhin. Does this raise any new concerns about Putin potentially doing more drastic things uh, regarding Ukraine, like nuclear weapons, or potentially against the U.S., like election interference? Well, first of all, they've already interfered in American elections, so that would not be anything new. Uh, they did that last time they tried to. But with regard to, I, I don't think there's any real prospect, you never know, but of, of Putin using nuclear weapons. Not only has the West, but China and the rest of the world have said, that's, don't go there. Don't go there, number two. Number three, I think that uh, determining what happens to Prigozhin, what happens to Vilnius, I mean, excuse me, what happens uh, when we discuss this in Vilnius is, uh, God only knows what, uh, what he's likely uh, to do. Well, I'm not even sure, we're not even sure where he is and what relationship he has. If I were he, I'd be careful what I ate. I'd be uh, keeping my eye on my menu. But all kidding aside, I, I, who knows? I don't know. I don't think any of us know for certain what the future of Prigozhin is in Russia. And, and so I, I don't know how to answer that question beyond that. And if I could also ask you something about happening back home. You're seeing the GOP grappling with tying abortion rights to defense issues, including a block on military promotions by Senator Tuberville. What does this uh, say about U.S. military readiness, readiness? And would you be willing to talk with Tuberville to try to work out some solution? I'd be willing to talk to him if I thought there was any possibility of him changing this ridiculous position he has. He's jeopardizing U.S. security by what he's doing. I expect the Republican Party to stand up, stand up, and do something about it. They, they have within their power to do that. The idea that we don't have a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the idea that we have all these, all these promotions that are in abeyance right now, that we don't know what's going to happen, the idea that we're injecting into uh, fundamental foreign policy decisions what, in fact, as a domestic social debate on social issues, is bizarre. I don't ever recall that happening, ever. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's just totally irresponsible, in my view. And uh, I, I just think that, uh, I mean, I'm confident that the mainstream of the Republican Party uh, no longer uh, does not support what he's doing. But they got to stand up and be counted. That's how it ends. And for President Nidisto, uh, you've been working on fortifying the fence along the border between Finland and Russia. Uh, is there anything that you're seeing recently that concerns you? And also, as a leader who shares a border with Russia, what more do you want to see done to deter Putin? Uh, during the <clears throat> beginning of uh, our application process, uh, surely we had to make sure first uh, trying to figure out uh, every possible uh, negative action we might meet and surely how we respond on that. And we were very careful on that work. So at the moment, the uh, situation is uh, quite calm. Hope it uh, remains as such. But uh, I just want to tell you that uh, uh, Finnish people do feel more secure at the moment. We have 80% of population supporting uh, NATO membership and uh, more than 80% who say that we will also protect our allies. That's the Finnish position. Thank you. This concludes the press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.